Suppose a rare Stradivarius violin is up for sale. The bidding comes down to two people. The greatest violinist in the world, who wants to play the magnificent instrument, and the wealthiest person in the world, who wants to put it on display in a museum. Now suppose the wealthy person outbids the violinist and wins the auction. Would you say that this outcome is just, in that the person who pays the most deserves to own the Stradivarius? Or would you say that this outcome is unjust, in that the person who can make the best use of the Stradivarius is the one who deserves to have it? Hello, brothers and sisters of Yuji Kang Chapel. Blessings in the name of the Lord. Recently, I attended an online course on justice taught by a Harvard law professor and political philosopher, Michael Sandel. Many ethical and moral dilemmas were discussed, and the short clip that you just watched is one of the many that highlighted questions and dilemmas of justice and morality in the world today. Last week, we looked at how the observation of issues under the sun, issues in this world, shapes life philosophies of individuals. And we concluded that we should form our worldview by walking with and, uh, and by being taught and touched by the one who can show us life beyond the realm under the sun, the one who is the way and the truth and the life, our Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, I also mentioned that in today's verses, especially verses 4 to 12, are some philosophies and principles that King Solomon might have considered that guided him in the application of justice. And that these principles flowed out from his observation in verse 1 that there is oppression under the sun. I also mentioned that the basis of many of King Solomon's observations and reflections were born out of his deep desire for an understanding and discerning heart in order to differentiate between right and wrong so as to govern his people well. So even as he concluded in verses 2 and 3 that it is best for people not to have been born so that they will not be exposed to the oppression, the cruelties and injustices of the world that day, King Solomon would have realized that he still had a nation to govern. There was still a population of citizens and immigrants, likely numbering a few million in total, that needed proper guidance and for justice to be applied wisely. Today, we will look at the verses that describe some considerations that King Solomon had to make in order to govern his people well and to apply justice. It may not be to decide to whom should the Stradivarius violin go, but it may be perhaps a harp. Let us pray. Our dearest Heavenly Father, open our eyes and open our ears and attune our hearts to your Spirit's guidance. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be found pleasing to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the most important considerations that King Solomon had to make in fact, all rulers and governments throughout history will have to consider this in order to govern well, was how to bring fulfillment to his people, how to satisfy his people's deepest desires with the resources he had. To begin answering that question, let us look at what I suggest is one of the most important verses in Ecclesiastes, and that is verse 11 of chapter 3. The New, In New Living Translation has it as, He has planted eternity in the human heart, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. The complete Jewish Bible translates this as, 
Also, he has given human beings an awareness of eternity, but in such a way that they can't fully comprehend from beginning to end the things God does. This awareness of eternity, placed in each human heart by God himself, is what gives us all the desire for significance. What characterizes this significance? And this verse tells us that what is truly significant has three characteristics. The first characteristic is that what is significant is eternal. What all human beings desire as significant must have an eternal quality to it. If it doesn't last, it is not eternal and therefore it cannot be significant. You have heard of active middle-aged people saying that this is the time of their lives when they desire to leave behind a legacy. And that is their way of expressing their desire for something significant, something that has an eternal quality to it. The second thing about true significance is that it involves the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. And man's desire for significance is to know and to participate somehow in God's work. Many of us would have heard about the story of the three brick layers. This story originated from a true story of Christopher Wren, the architect who was commissioned to rebuild St. Paul's Cathedral in London after the fire in 1666. One day, he observed three bricklayers. He asked one of them, what are you doing? And the bricklayer replied, I'm laying bricks to feed my family. He asked the same question to the second bricklayer and he got the reply, I am building a wall. The third bricklayer, who was the most productive worker among the three and the future leader of the group, was also asked this question and he answered with a gleam in his eye, I am a cathedral builder. I am building a great cathedral to the Almighty. So what will give each of us a sense of significance is to know and to participate in God's work. The third characteristic of what is truly significant, unfortunately, is that it is currently hidden from our view. The whole scope of God's work cannot be fully understood on this side of eternity. The brick layer who thinks he was building a cathedral to the Almighty, he will never know if the cathedral will last or if someday it will be destroyed. Hence, it is really almost impossible to find that significant thing that will truly satisfy our deepest desire. And so, King Solomon concluded that everything is havel, meaningless, vanity, like vapour that cannot be grasped. Nonetheless, the desire for an eternal significance is still there in each and every one of our hearts. In the words of Blaise Pascal, the infinite abyss can only be filled by an infinite and immutable object, that is to say, only by God himself. So when people cannot see and understand and therefore cannot participate in the whole of God's work, the whole scope of God's work, which brings true fulfillment and significance, they begin to therefore find substitutes for significance. King Solomon did that, trying to find fulfillment and wisdom and knowledge, and we read that in chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes. In the accomplishment of product, projects, in possessions and pleasure, and that is in chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes. But he concluded that all of these things were meaningless, that none of these could truly satisfy his desire for significance. But his desire to govern his kingdom well was still there. And King Solomon also must have asked this question, how do I bring what is right and what is good for my people and yet advance the cause of my kingdom? How do I help my people attain what they truly desire? What is it that my people truly and deeply desire? 
And these are likely the common questions that are asked by all wise rulers and governments. So King Solomon summarized some of his observations about what his people desired. As the people in his kingdom searched for significance, King Solomon noticed that they were just like him, finding their significance in the same substitutes. So he made this observation in verse 4 of chapter 4. Then I observed that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbours. These people in his kingdom were finding their significance in possessions and pleasure just as he had done so. When they saw their neighbours possessing something that they did not have or enjoying a pleasure that they could not enjoy, it motivated them to work to acquire these possessions and these pleasures, substitutes for significance and symbols of what he termed success. Then King Solomon observed that not everyone accorded the same significance to possessions and pleasures. And he wrote a statement in verse 5. The New Living Translation uh, translates it as, Fools fold their idle hands, leading them to ruin. The English Standard Version has it as, The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Essentially, this is describing a group of people whom society regarded as fools who found no significance in a pursuit of material things. Unfortunately, they carried this to such an extent that they did nothing even to subsist. They did nothing to feed themselves, nor to maintain themselves. So King Solomon concluded in the next verse that the middle ground is probably best for his people. Better to have one handful with quietness than two handfuls with hard work and chasing the wind. For his kingdom's people, King Solomon also noticed that people found their significance in each other, in communities. And this, he agreed, is something wise and something um, good. And therefore, he wrote the verses in verses 9 to 12. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person fails, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone, he is in real trouble. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. But he also noticed that again, not everyone accorded the same significance in community. He observed in verses 7 to 8 and pronounced this as meaningless. I observe yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is a case of a man who is all alone, without a child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But then he asks himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It is all so meaningless and depressing. So. How does a king govern and how do governments make policies for the good of its people? A people with diverse views of what is important and what is not important, what is significant and what is not significant. This debate about justice has accompanied human civilization from the very beginning. I won't go into the details because I really um, do not know much about this, but most of us would have heard about questions of justice, like uh, what was shown in the clip at the beginning, who should be given that Stradivarius violin, that billionaire who could afford to pay millions for the violin, or a world-renowned violinist who can use the violin to bring beautiful music to many? Or what about the issue of taxes? Should the government impose an inheritance tax on its people, 
meaning that if a father leaves his wealth to his children, part of that wealth somehow goes to the government. Or the issue of surrogacy. Should the government allow or prohibit surrogate motherhood so that the lives of its people can be uplifted? And this is not even mentioning other even more controversial and sensitive issues. Such debates about justice and morality will no doubt draw on ideas and concepts written about by philosophers throughout the ages. Philosophers such as Aristotle, John Locke, Immanuel Kant, John Rawls. And these are the names that I learned uh, through the cause and justice. And these ideas include teleological reasoning from Aristotle, the distribution of things based on the purpose or the goal, concepts of morality and freedom by Immanuel Kant, concepts of individual rights and majority rule by John Locke, concepts of equality and meritocracy by John Rawls, concepts of communitarianism. All this wisdom and all these concepts and philosophies on justice, I propose to you would probably have been thought about and ruminated upon by King Solomon. Why? He was given by God a wise and understanding heart, such as no one else has had or ever will have. We read that in 1 Kings chapter 3. These philosophies of justice and morality are good, but are somehow insufficient to satisfy man's desire for significance. How do we know that? King Solomon himself declared that when he wrote in verses 13 to 16. And for this, I'm going to read from the complete Jewish Bible. Verse 13. Better a youth who is poor but wise than a king who is old but foolish, no longer willing to listen to advice. True, he rose from prison to be king, yet while ruling, he became poor. I observe that all who live and walk under the sun took the side of the youth mentioned first, who would rule in place of the king, and that no limit was set for the number of his subjects. Nevertheless, those who come afterwards will not regard him highly. This too is certainly pointless and feeding on wind. What King Solomon wrote about in these four verses was essentially that these philosophies and concepts of justice can carry a ruler or a government to power. But there will come a time when the philosophy of a king, or for that matter, a government, will no longer match or satisfy the desires of his people in their perpetual search for significance. And when the time comes, the people will install a new king or a new government. With time, even this new king or new government will give way to someone else. Hence, all of this cycling of rulers and powers and governments driven by the changing philosophies of justice are also meaningless. What then is the answer to man's search for significance? King Solomon does not answer directly, but wrote in the next verse, and I read from the complete Jewish Bible again, Watch your step when you go to the house of God. Offering to listen is better than fools offering sacrifices because they don't discern whether or not they are doing evil. Most English translations of the Bible places this verse with chapter 5, but the Hebrew text and therefore the complete Jewish Bible places it as the last verse of chapter 4. King Solomon was directing his readers to seek significance in the house of God and there to carefully listen rather than to offer sacrifices. What can we find when we listen carefully in the house of God, when we seek Him with all our hearts and our minds? The first thing we can be sure of is that at the end of it all, our longing for eternal significance will be satisfied. It may not be satisfied while we are still on earth, but we have faith that it will be satisfied 
in eternity. And that is why Jesus taught his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And the New Living Translation has it as, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. For me, and I think most Singaporean males will identify with this as well, the analogy of knowing that you will find significance in eternity is really like being a soldier during reservist training. If you know that you are guaranteed to go back home to your loving families and to your cozy beds a few days later, Really, the mud and rain of a field camp, the fatigue and pain of a pulled muscle or a sprained knee um, from charging up and down some hill uh, or into and out of some jungle uh, really becomes much more bearable, isn't it? If we know that our longing for eternal significance will be satisfied, what is that little bit of temporary injustice here and now? What is a bit of temporary inconvenience here and now? It is therefore not surprising to find one of the apostles, Peter in this case, writing a verse like this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Peter was urging the church to have the mentality of a temporary resident while here on earth. This is because when you know where you ultimately will be, and because you know what your significance is founded upon, you don't encumber yourself with insignificant and transient things. So the first thing that will happen when we approach God with full attention and contrition is that we know and will be given faith that our longing for eternal significance will be satisfied. The second thing that we will find when we seek God and listen carefully in His presence is that we will begin to glimpse and understand some part of the whole scope of God's work. Not only that, but when we see and understand how we can participate in some part of God's work, we will find our true calling, which is our participation in God's work. We will be like the bricklayer who declared that his bricklaying is building a cathedral to the Almighty, not just a wall, not just so that we can buy the next meal for our families, but we are participating in something that will last for eternity. Isn't that exciting? And all of this because we know the bigger picture and because we can participate in what is truly significant. For this to happen, we have to allow God to open our eyes and to illumine and transform the eyes of our mind. Therefore, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of a mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And when Paul wrote about our minds, he meant not only our thoughts, but also our attitudes, our perspectives, our whole worldview. Jesus proclaimed in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let us approach God and allow His Holy Spirit to illumine our minds. I close today's sermon singing the first verse of a hymn by Clara Scott and may this be our prayer. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth 
thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me. Spirit divine. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, open our eyes. Open our eyes to see what is truly significant. Give us faith to know that what is truly significant lies beyond this world and lies in knowing you. Open our eyes to know the whole scope of your work so that we can participate and find our significance in your calling for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.